Villa Reborn presents Welcome to Physiology of Acquired Tastes, an Age of Revolution scenario for Cthulhu Eternal. I'm William Adcock, the author, and I will be running the playtest today. Hi, I'm Dean. I will be playing Jean-Paul Langlois. And I am Chad. I will be playing Edmund Jordan. We should make a deal up front to not try to do any French accents, because they'll be terrible. I am absolutely not doing the Monty Python French (laughs) accent. (laughs) Everybody should be thankful. All right, so a little bit of historical background for this scenario. We are in France in November 1830. The big thing in recent months has been a second French Revolution, the glorious three days in July, which hosted King Charles X. Charles was an ultra-right-wing absolute monarch who was trying to undo the the social developments that had taken place since the revolution and Bonaparte's reign. He's trying to take things back to pre-revolutionary times and it did not go well. The current king on the throne is Louis Philippe of the Orleans branch of the Bourbon family. So his government is referred to as the Orleanist government. There are a number of political factions at play in France right now. The Orleanists support the House of Orleans. The Legitimists want to restore Charles X. The Bonapartists, as the name suggests, want to restore the family of Napoleon Bonaparte and the Empire. And the Republicans are sick of all these people and want direct representative democracy. What happened to Charles, Uh, by the way? uh, He fled France, but he was not killed. He was encouraged to abdicate the throne. He tried to pass it to his 10-year-old grandson, and people were not having that. So it has been about four months, three or four months since the, since the revolution. There is a push by very left-leaning members of the Orleanist government to oust and punish legitimists. And there is also pushback going the other way, resulting in Louis-Philippe's government not making anyone happy. But that is not something people are wholly aware of just yet. I think that takes care of our historical background. You know, the main thing to take away is that there is this push and pull between the hard-right legitimists the centrist Orleanists, and the far-left Republicans. It is now Friday, November 5th, and the two of you have been invited to a meeting to discuss a matter of some urgency and delicacy with Christophe Augustin Gautier, a minor bureaucrat in the city government of Reims, which is where you are, not Paris. He welcomes you into the sitting room of his modest townhouse, apologizing for the inconvenience, and ensures that the two of you have been introduced to each other. He acknowledges that he has been made aware of your reputations for integrity and discretion. Over coffee, he asks you if you've noticed that the Orleanist government is 
not interested in the fair and equal enforcement of the law. Well, that is very true. Um, things were so much better under under Charles. Much fairer, I have found. I would beg to differ there, uh, good sir. <laughs> well, I guess everyone is entitled to this opinion. Yes, we do live in a modern age, after all. Mm. Uh, Gautier nods and says, while we must view his majesty's stated objective of true justice for all of France with respect, we cannot deny that enforcement has not been even-handed, and it is truly regrettable that this has been the case these past few months. Not to ignore the excesses of the previous monarch, nor to excuse them, certainly, but I cannot help but fear that the Republicans and revolutionaries who have the king's ear will bend him towards unnecessarily punitive measures against the legitimists. As he pours himself another cup of coffee, he acknowledges that he lived through the purges initiated by Robespierre and has no desire to see a repeat of those dark days. Indeed so. I say this because I want your help. A rather hideous crime has been committed, but which the police force here in Reims has thus far declined to investigate, despite the grotesqueness of the crime. I believe this disinterest stems from the fact that the most prominent victim was one Jean-Francois Desjardins, who had served faithfully as an undersecretary to one of Charles' ministers before retiring this past July and resettling in Reims. It sounds like a most terrible crime against one of the people that have given so much for the state. Yes. You see, Desjardins passed away 10 days ago of heart failure and had allegedly been buried in the North Cemetery. However, two days ago, a wagon traveling north out of Reims suffered a broken axle and spilled its contents onto the road. Human corpses, each sewn into a sack and then stacked like firewood in the back of the cart. One of the sacks had torn open as it tumbled from the wagon, revealing the face of Desjardins. No driver was present, and the cart's destination is unknown. The matter is being hushed up, but I've been able to find no evidence that any investigation is being made into who is responsible for this vile act of desecration. I cannot help but believe that Desjardins' politics, being officially unpopular at present, play a role in this lack of investigation. Do you know uh, any of the other identities of dearly departed that were found in this terrible state? I do not. None were particularly recognizable. Many appear to have been members of the poor and working class of Reims, but I believe it is the, in the best interest of all of France, regardless of politics, that grave robbers not be allowed to operate with impunity. Mm -hmm. Could not agree more. I would like the two of you to investigate how and why Desjardins' mortal remains wound up in a sack in the back of a wagon almost a week after he was allegedly buried. Are you aware of where his remains were taken after this hideous discovery? I, I am, yes. And going into his desk, he pulls out a small pouch and tosses it to Jean-Paul. You can hear the clink of money as, it, as you catch it. The sound I like. Gentlemen, <laughs> I am, if nothing else, a political realist. I acknowledge that you may need to grease certain palms to gain the information I've asked you to retrieve. Uh, if the money there is not enough, please let me know. I'm sure we will. And, and do you know the location of Hit Jardin's intended burial plot? Not the plot itself, just that it, he was to be buried in the North Cemetery. So you know the burial ground then? Okay. 
did Jadan have any next of kin survivors that may uh, have an opinion on his uh, people that may be motivated to uh, act in this despicable way? No, he had no children and never married. I met the man socially a few times, and forgive me, but he was bland, boring, and readily forgettable during those interactions. If you wish, I can write to Paris for more information on his time in government, if you believe it would help you. This stage, we know nothing beyond what you've told us, so that might be helpful to start that process, at least since it will take a few days for the mail to get to Paris and any research be performed and that information then to be returned to you. Certainly. Gentlemen, I wish you luck with your investigation. I hope this is a fairly small matter in the big scheme of things. An important thing to make right, I fear, given the Certainly. vehicle state that this country has descended into. If we are to have a strong and just France for our children and grandchildren, these things must be resolved. Bill, since I also had spent some time working for the government in that period that Desjardins was working for, under Charles, uh, would I know anything of his background? You know what? Go ahead and give me an administration role. That is a success. All right. Yeah, you had met him once or twice at mm -hmm. uh, formal events. And you agree with Gautier's assessment. He was just a bland, boring, forgettable human being. You can't imagine him having enemies. His activity in Charles X's government had more to do with that was the government in place at the time than any ideological drive. Fair enough. Sounds like a small cog in a very large machine. If the Orleanists had not begun a systematic purge of civil servants from Charles Day, he would probably still be working there. Does Gautier know where Jardin lived? Yes, he can get you an address. It's one of the more upscale neighborhoods. All right, well, I guess we'll thank uh, Gautier for his excellent coffee and set about investigating this most heinous crime. All right. What would you like to do first? I think perhaps first we should view the corpses mm -hmm. and possibly also the scene of the crime. Yes, we should definitely uh, investigate the North Cemetery just to see if we can see where these bodies were extracted. And also, um, if we can find out where the wagon broke down, perhaps we can learn something there as well. You get the lay of the land, so to speak. Yes, and also maybe try to get a bit of an idea of where somebody might have fled to once it broke down. Maybe we should go there first and just check out. And possibly the... also assess and maybe infer where they were going. Yeah, so let's start with that. Let's find the scene of the breakdown. All right. So to do that, I think you are going to need to speak with a member of the Reims police force. So, heading to the central police precinct in Reims, would one of you like to throw some weight around with a social role to get past the desk sergeant and speak to someone who actually knows anything? I'm happy to throw a bootlick roll at it. One of my favorite skills in the Age of Revolutions SRD. I was so happy when I saw that skill. <laughs> Go right ahead. Success. All right. So you talk your way past the desk sergeant and find yourself in front of Leon Duval, who is a heavy set man with a rather thick mustache. And he kind of eyes you with some suspicion because you are both obviously well-dressed citizens. And he's curious as to what is bringing you to his desk on a Friday afternoon. Well, Mr. Duval, we are here looking into a rather heinous crime that has been committed. And we are just 
looking for any guidance that the esteemed gendarmerie, gendarmes of Reims can provide for us. We are looking for where the wagon overturned that was found to be carrying the bodies. I'm going to refrain from mentioning a specific name at this point. So assume there was just one wagon of bodies that overturned. If he says, do you mean the east one or the west one? And <laughs> Well, that's the information last, of it. So, <laughs> Or last Thursday or today. He glances rather sharply at Edmund and says, I don't know how you've come by this information, but I don't think there's anything I can tell you about this case. You are neither of you police officers, and I don't see how it is any of your business well i i think any member of the of the general public should be taking an interest in such a terrible incident and if the uh, the reams police is not being forthright and honest with the populace i don't know how you can hope to be trusted ian would you like to make a uh, i think that might be a harangue roll oh fumble he is not buying it and he looks you up and down and asks you if you're some sort of a lawyer. Well, as it happens, uh, I do have membership in that esteemed profession. But one thing also, I have a very, very sound knowledge of how business is done in France. And I'll take out the, the pouch of coins and jingle it around. So perhaps if you uh, could name a figure. Hmm. He kind of glances around and sees that no one is paying much attention to this conversation and he very neatly writes the number 20 on a slip of paper and slides okay. it in your direction. Alright, well I'll take out the appropriate coinage to pay him that quantity of currency. So to start if you're asking what denomination of coins do we have? Are they sous? Are they francs? You know? Francs. Okay. Well, I'm assuming that the quantity we have is sufficient to cover that. Yes. Yes. You pay him the 20 francs. A donation to the benevolent fund. <laughs> There's always one of those. Yep. They're very he, benevolent. Uh, he tells you the wagon was discovered one mile north of Reims. And he points out the road that it was found on. And does he have a map? Yes, he can show you a map of the region. Looking at the topography of the area, what is it? Uh, it's it's pretty flat. Okay. Is it is it sort of uh, farmland? There's some. It's mostly farmland, yes, with some scattered orchards. And did this happen near an orchard? Yes, it did. Okay. And looking at the map, and I can toss a navigate roll that if you want. Looking at the map where it happened, are there any one destination over another that jumps out at me? Give me a navigation roll, please. Okay. Success with a 58. Nothing in particular. There are various small farming communities past the border of Reims. Mm -hmm. But the wagon was found really too close to Reims to give you a good sense of where it might have been going. Okay. Well, I suppose, Edmund, it is time for us to hail a carriage. One mile is far too far to walk. Yes, unless we have horses. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, if we were peasants, perhaps. Oh, shall we take a coach, then? I'd say so. Okay. All right. So you can easily rent a coach. Would you like me to hail the coach? I'm not going to make you roleplay that. Okay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm just saying if you'd like me to hail the coach, then perhaps, good sir, you could toss me something from that bag in my in my way. I think we can probably use the money to pay the driver. Yes, um, easily. going to take a finder's fee. One must be prudent with the funds that we've been given. And as long as we're asking, what's the weather? Uh, it is It is bitterly cold, but it is not snowing. Uh, okay. There's not yet been a snowfall this year. Okay, so no precipitation or anything? No rain? Okay. Nothing in the last two weeks. Okay. All right, well, we'll uh, get into our coach and uh, tell the driver to head out north on the north road. All right. 
it does not take you particularly long to reach your destination. The wagon has, of course, since been removed from the scene. Mm-hmm. There is a an orchard of pear trees that comes up almost to the road. Is there anybody working in there at the moment? Not this late in the day. Any nearby farmsteads or even a hamlet within sight distance? There's a, a farmhouse within within sight. Would it be a hike, I guess, to get there? Yeah, not right, a leisurely so stroll, but... The orchard. Okay. Is there a carriage w- road that goes there? Uh, to the house? Give me a luck roll, please. Mm. Critical luck. 33. Uh, yes, there is a, a driveway, effectively. Well, so very civilized. I thought for a moment my boots might get some mud on them, which is be avoided at all costs. Well, shall we perhaps give this area a quick once-over? Definitely. Trump Paul, and then head to the farmhouse to see if they perhaps know anything? A most excellent plan. Would you like trolls from us, or...? Uh, sure. Go right ahead. And I'm going to assume that... How long ago was this accident and the discovery? Two days. Two days. I'm going to assume that anything maybe in the road has either been scooped up by the initial investigators, if there were any, or just curious passers-by. So I'm going to focus my attention on the tree line. And one other question. I mean, this carriageway, has it been around a while so that it's kind of become a rut in the ground and maybe the trees are up higher? If you think of that classic scene from the Lord of the Rings movie where the hobbits hide over the bank from the the ring wraith, where... The yeah. road is down I, lower. Yeah, I would say this farmstead has probably been here for two generations or so, and the carriageway has you know, worn down to a rut. We both conveniently failed our search rolls. Yeah, <laughs> but neither terribly. You know, to the no. point of say fumbling. Well, well Jean Paul, so, I, I am not finding anything of value here. No, no, it is just a mucky road. Mm-hmm. Shall we continue on to the stead? I think so. I think maybe we can have a civilized conversation and possibly another cup of coffee. I would just like you to know that it does not get this cold in Martinique. Well, it does not get this cold in a well-heated chateau either. Uh, Looking at the farmhouse, though, I'm not sure there's going to be much difference between the outside and the inside. Mm, Yes, well, let's let's not tarry there too long then. (laughs) I think we need to get back somewhere warm by uh, nightfall. My constitution, I'm sure, won't uh, deal with anything too cold. So, uh, knocking at the door of the farmstead, you are met by a stocky, middle-aged man who gives his name as Jordan Lapointe. And sizing the two of you up and looking at the carriage you rode in on, he says... uh, what can I do for you two gentlemen? Well, Mr. Lapont, were you aware of the accident that occurred here two days in the past? Yes, indeed. I was the I was the unfortunate soul to find the scene of the accident at Dawn's first light. I'm very, very sorry that that has happened to you. We yes. are just doing further inquiries into the event. Have you spoken to anyone yet regarding this? Not since my initial statement to the police. Okay. We're very interested in hearing your your account in your own words, perhaps with the benefit of having some days to reflect upon it, so you'd be willing to recount the day's events again to us. I rose at dawn, as is my custom, and when I stepped outside to begin the day's labors, I noticed the wagon by the side of the road this late in the year with the pear trees not full of life, full of leaves. It's easy enough to see the road from here. And thinking there had been an accident, I went and investigated. The mule was still tethered to the wagon, but there was no sign of any driver. I thought at first they were transporting firewood or something of that nature, but when I took a look around the back of the wagon, I saw a man's face staring at me from within a burlap sack, and it was quite clearly not a fresh corpse, but rather one that had been deceased for several days. 
How many Three. were there? The estimates there were, are fine. There were 12 such bundles. Okay. Did the wagon look like it had been there for a long time or just recently abandoned? I can't imagine it had been there longer than maybe two or three hours. Mm-hmm. And uh, have you ever seen a wagon such as this? Was I imagine you you see this road frequently as you're out working. Have you ever seen a, a wagon like this before passing by? It was a very ordinary wagon. If I hadn't seen that face, I would have thought nothing of it. The police showed up with a wagon of their own, loaded the bodies into it. They took the mule and had the wagon itself taken away. And you, you saw no signs whatsoever of the drover? None. None. And do you remember the name of the officer who led the delegation? Uh... And I guess while you ponder that, how long after you found the wagon did the police arrive? Uh... He raced into town. Laponte? Yes. Okay. And the police returned with him. Okay. So it wasn't like he found the wagon and then, coincidentally, the police showed up like somebody else had reported it. Okay. Right. Okay. So uh, I assume there was no suggestion or evidence that the wagon had encountered some sort of accident that uh, had caused it to stop. I had, I had heard there was a broken axle. Broken axle. Yes. Oh, yes. The, yes, you're right. The axle was broken. And was there a, a stone in the road that might have caused the breakage? Not that I had seen, but the, the wagon itself looked fairly old, and perhaps not well maintained. And no markings on the side? No. No words or anything painted? No, not that I recall seeing. Okay. Do you have any further questions uh, for the good man, Jean-Paul? I don't believe so. I think it's been very, very helpful. Very, very helpful indeed, okay. Mr. Laponte. And please accept our consolations for the, the terrible event that you've had to witness. It, it's most distressing that the administration has allowed France to reach such a, a parlous state that grave robbers should be so bold in their movements around this country. And also, yes, good, good sir. King Louis Philippe does thank you for your service. Yes, well, it's certainly not like the old days. If we'd had a Bonaparte on the throne like God intended, you could be sure these things would not be happening. Have you ever heard tales of grave robbers in this part of the country before? I must say I have not. No, never. Hmm. Do you have any theory or, or thoughts, opinions about what might have actually driven a, a person to um, take corpses from a burying ground in this enlightened age? No, sir, I can't say that I have any speculation on that point. I have heard in my travels of the resurrectionists mm. in England who will exhume bodies or, I guess, disinter the interred. And sell them. Well, yes, but that is that is English. That is English, yes. I mean, a civilized country, this would never happen, I'm sure. Mind you, we no. uh, are dangerously descending into a state uh, where civilization must be only a, an aspirational memory for us. We are descending into a state of Englishness. <laughs> That's right. We're getting more English all the time. We'll soon be and, speaking the language. Oh, no. For the record, Burke and Hare were hanged for their crimes just two years before this takes place. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yes, you probably would have heard of Burke and Hare. Well, I think we'll take our leave of Mr. Laponte and thank him very much for his time. It's been quite helpful. Now, my good man, Edmund, is there anything else you want to look at? This cold sea is starting to bite my bones. I want to return to where the wagon was found. And range further afield, since it's only been two days and it's been very cold, it's possible that boot prints were captured in some of the soil. Obviously, it's been a very busy area, so I want to range a little further afield and search for basically frozen boot prints that might be going off, the, off in a strange direction. Off of the road, you mean? Yes, off of the road, and look for ones that would just 
strike is not anonymous for like, why would someone be walking in that direction? Okay. Nope. But I've improved. <laughs> yes. So the boot prints you do find, uh, you're pretty certain are from the police. Okay. I guess, shall we return to Reims in... I think I think you... we must be ready for some supper. My stomach is growling, and a fine a fine bottle of wine is also calling my name. Yes. So, will the two of you be dining together? Um. Is it, I was going to say, is my fiance in Reims? Uh, yes. Oh well, in that case, I would definitely be willing to have dinner with you, Edmund. <laughs> well, I guess as is true to the time, we would dine together and then I would go. Well, we should at least take a few drinks to discuss what our plan for tomorrow is. I think it's the very right. moment, once we get back other yeah. when we are civilized men. And I, I am sure there is a, a club that we would attend. You can certainly find a fashionable and comfortable cafe. Mm-hmm. Especially in the Orleans district. Hmm. So, what is your plan for the next day? Order a, a good bottle of wine and just sit there and drink it. And while he does that, did we get a, a name for an officer from the farmer, uh, Lepont. Mr. Lepont? Yes, Bertrand LaRue. Bertrand, and his rank? Uh, Sergeant. Sergeant, so much lower than whom we spoke to earlier. Yes. So he, okay. he was the first one on the scene, as it were. Okay. So I think we should speak to him, see if we can figure out where the bodies went. Well, didn't we get told where the bodies were taken? Oh, did we? Yes. Okay. So I think maybe that's our first port of call, is to inspect the remains before somebody moves them somewhere else, perhaps. Yes. Yeah, that, that's a good idea. By that stage, maybe have a good lunch after that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and maybe bring your little satchel of dried flowers so that... You can cover up the smell. (laughs) Thank you for reminding me. Mm -hmm. I'll take it out now. (laughs) Take a good deep whiff on it. All right. So I assume nothing else eventful happens of the evening? Correct. It is a quiet evening. As quiet as you would like it to be. All right, well, since I don't have any carouse skill, I guess it's probably, there's no, no carousing. It's just a quiet dinner and heading home. I can carouse quite... very badly. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a skill that's worth having, but I do not, sadly. Very quiet life, especially these days. Um, so next morning we'll meet up. And so where were the bodies taken? Was it actually somewhere in Reims, I'm assuming? Yes. A surgeon or something? A... A small mortuary on the city's edge, away from the wealthier neighborhoods. And it does occur to you that it's rather interesting that these were not brought to the police morgue to be treated as evidence of a crime. Not surprising, though, that it seemed to be very interested. (laughs) All right. Well, we'll knock on the door and inquire bright and early. All right. So you step into the mortuary and... You hear a, what you think at first is a woman's voice calling from the back that they will be right with you, but the voice, it turns out, belongs to a very slim, balding man who mops his forehead with a handkerchief as he comes out to meet you. Yes, yes, uh, what can I do for you? I'm hoping you are next of kin of one of these. Well, we won't know until we've seen them all, I suspect, but... I was wondering, why were these remains brought here? A convenient dumping ground for those pig-headed drunkards in the gendarmerie, Hmm. no doubt. Disgraceful. You know, I've had no direction from the city whatsoever as to what I was supposed to do with this sudden influx of bodies. I only had two assistants, and one of them quit upon seeing the police bring a dozen bags of bodies through my door. That is a remarkable quantity of deceased. I will 
give the city government one more day to provide me with direction before I throw all of these in a pauper's grave, just for sanitation's sake. So were all of the remains paupers themselves, or were there gentlemen also in the mix? Your guess is as good as mine. Death is, as they say, the great equalizer. Well, indeed, but uh, were any of them dressed in any finery, or just all found without any raiment at all, or what was... Well, maybe we should just inspect, maybe we should have a look ourselves, if you don't mind. And by the way, I'll introduce myself, my name is Jean-Paul Langlois. Uh, and I also gives, introduce myself. He gives his name as Thierry Constantine, and mm -hmm. Jean-Paul, go ahead and give me a bootleg roll. That's 14. Right. So he... He leads you back and awkwardly cautions you to watch where you put your hands. The smell is overwhelming. Thank you, Edmund, for reminding me to bring my special little bag to put under my nose. Oh, dear. So there are a dozen bodies in various states of decay. What about completeness? They are complete. They've uh, not been dismembered? No. So are they out on tables or just in, piled in a, in a heap on the floor? Or He has about half of them on tables and the rest on shelves. Okay. And which one is our target? Well, Where that's is he? going to be something to find out. Constantine does not know the identities of any of the bodies. Okay, well, let's get to it and uh, split the task up. And so we know it. He looks like that, right? I've met him before well, in life. Okay. <laughs> but also I figure that, to be honest, a uh, life lived in poverty is going to make somebody much more worn down in death than they would a, a fine, high-living man like Desjardins. So I do not expect this task will take very long. That's when we learn that you... Know, 11 of them are from wealthy <laughs> families. <laughs> that could happen. Both of you actually give me intelligence rolls, please. Uh-oh. Actually, not too oh. bad. I did fail, but <laughs> but uh, Chad did get a critical with an O one, one which is yep. as bright as a button. So going from body to body, Edmund is able to deduce that the silver-haired gentleman who was plump even before the loading of decomposition with signs of gout in his feet can reasonably be inferred to be the body of an affluent government official like Desjardins. It seems like a and, cruel pusher to me. And as long as I'm inspecting the bodies, are there... Desjardins has been dead for two days, right? Uh, ten, so he's been, yeah, longer. Ten, he was buried. Yep. Oh, that's right. He was buried for a week and then mm -hmm. found two days ago. Are all these bodies relatively the same in terms of decomposition? Like, are we looking at people who died and were buried within a near time, or are we looking at some that might be skeletal and others that are quite new? Uh, they're all probably between a week and two weeks dead. So, so still pretty fresh. Okay. So do the bodies have signs of soil and things on them, or are they no. still fairly clean? Okay, yep. Still clean. They were presumably all interred in coffins, or at least bags? Yes. Okay. Looking at Desjardins, is there any obvious trauma to the body? Nothing that isn't explained away by his fall out of the wagon. Okay. I know what I want to ask, and I know I shouldn't ask it, but... <laughs> <laughs> any joke about falling off the wagon? No. I don't no, think this gen gentleman ever did that. Yeah. He's... <laughs> With feet like Once that. in his life. Yeah. <laughs> um, so after we've done a, a survey of all the bodies, what was the general assessment? Was Desjardins the only well-to-do kind of body in amongst the mix, or was there others that looked like they were possibly wealthy as well, or relatively wealthy? He stands out as the only corpse with soft hands, basically. Mm -hmm. It's a corpse with status. Yes. The others all appear to have been workers or even the homeless. Mm -hmm. So if we give the body a good once over, is it worth trying to just do a, a deep dive on his body top to bottom? A quick search. Sure. What are you looking for? 
Well, any signs of anything abnormal about the body for starters, and then I guess anything, anything like anomalous. That. Yeah, and also maybe anything like there's any puncture wounds or something like that, suggestion maybe he's had something injected into him or blood taken from him or something like that? Uh, go ahead and give me a search roll. I, I, I was concerned that me asking if there were any bite marks would stand out, but here's Dean looking in. A, <laughs> yeah, you know, for... Chad found something. If it's something yeah. to find. Well, yeah. I didn't. <laughs> yeah, I, so, I, I didn't want to ask about bite marks because I wouldn't think I'd have a reason to ask. <laughs> oh, come on, this is France. Uh, It'd probably say it's a love bite. Sorry, I, and then I thought, you know, it's probably he's probably covered in rat bites. <laughs> well, that's probably true. They all are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um. No unexplainable bites, puncture wounds. You know, there's nothing heaving under his skin. That's good. You know, it is unusual. <laughs> it is the sad and shrunken mortal clay of an aging bureaucrat, and possibly a little bit of a memento mori to uh, to Jean Paul, especially. Mm-hmm. Well, this is very uncomfortable. Okay, so I might well. Edmund is doing his close search because I'm clearly not up to the task. Uh, I might try to track down Thierry and have a bit of a chat to him if he's still around the place. Oh, yes, he's nearby. So, Mr. Mr. Constantine, uh, this is a, a terrible situation. I, you must feel most set upon. I, I'm, I'm interested in drawing on your expertise. So have you ever heard of something like this ever happening before in Reams? In Reams, no. You would... You would expect something like this from, you know, the Austrians or something. Oh, well, the English. <laughs> Those <Yes>. Habsburgs. <laughs> Good French people wouldn't do this, surely. No, this is blasphemy of the highest degree. Do, do you have an opinion on who could have done such a foul act? Apart from the Austrians, of course, and I don't believe there are so many in France these days. Oh, we should be so lucky. Um... <laughs> the Lichtensteinians. Uh... <laughs> no, he he does not have any particular opinions on this. Okay. Are there plans for a priest to revisit the bodies to reconsecrate them? Yes, I'll be calling on one later this afternoon, especially if the city government does not get back to me with what they want done with the bodies. Well, especially the remains of a gentleman. I really shouldn't be allowed to just sit here in in such a terrible state anyway. It's like I can't believe that the gendarmerie would allow such a an outrage. It certainly is a disgrace. I feel like complaining to the head of the police. Or at least the he sergeant. Kind of, Constantine laughs bitterly and says, you know, let me know how well that goes for you. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, so I look from Desjardins. To John Paul and back to Desjardins. Slowly, gently, that is how a life is taken. Well, I see a life well lived. Speaking of which, I do think there might be time for a luncheon feast and possibly a glass of sherry after such a disturbing, disturbing sight. So, Mr. Jordan, unless there's something else that you'd like to inspect while we're here, I am feeling quite faint. You truly do have a delicate constitution, don't you? <laughs> Well, appreciation of the finer things in life, I think, is the way I see it. Okay. And this is most definitely one of the finer things in life, or even the destination that one should be forced to accept in death. Well, uh, bear with me one moment. I realize that we are here for the investigation into what happened to Desjardins, but perhaps there are clues on some of the other bodies, and I'd like to give them a once-over. That sounds like a plan. I'll wait outside with my bag of potpourri. Perhaps you can get a Bordeaux to go or something. <laughs> Find a place that does a drive through, perhaps. Yeah, take the coach right through it, yes. <laughs> Would you like another search roll or just piggyback off of the previous one? It's up to you. Yeah, go ahead and give me another search roll. Just a Oops. success. Nothing else in particular really catches your eye about any of the bodies. They're all more or less in the same shape, same relative state of decomposition. There's no unusual marks that you can find on any of them. Are they all male? 
mix of male and female. Relative ages? All ages. The youngest was probably in their 30s. And so all adults? All adults. Okay. Desjardins in his 70s was probably the oldest. But as you said, many of the working class bodies were prematurely aged by their lifestyle. And so I guess now we will feed Jean-Paul and then yes. visit the burying ground? That's right. Yes. I'm sure uh, whatever I have will be wafer thin. Uh, Jean-Paul, as you step outside, please give me an alertness roll. Okay, try that. Alertness. Oh, I'm not especially alert. No, it was a failure. All right. You're caught up with your uh, potpourri. Mm hmm. It is very disarming. The two of you find some lunch and you are heading to the burial ground. You said. Correct. Yep. That's the last place on our list of obvious places to go. The cemetery is easy enough to find. And uh, you can inquire with the caretaker for where Desjardins was buried. Well, also just interested to know whether all of these bodies were taken from the North Burying Ground, whether he thinks... Yeah, I figured they... that would be a question for the caretaker. Correct. Uh... To his knowledge, there have not been any bodies disinterred from the North Cemetery. Not even Desjardins? He's happy to show you the undisturbed grave. The so undisturbed that. grave of Desjardins? Yes. Like, it's got, you know, 10-day-old dirt on it and everything? Yep. And, yeah, there is no sign of any recent disturbance. Well, uh, this is unusual. Yes, it is. So you know, uh, know what this means? There's some unscrupulous undertaker somewhere that's giving off all of the money for burials and actually burying empty coffins instead. Yeah, I, Bodies... I thought you were going to say there's like an unscrupulous dirt monger selling 10-day-old dirt. Well, that's possible. Uh, counterfeit dirt. How do you actually... Or someone is stealing the bodies from below. <laughs> we wouldn't think of that, though. <laughs> no, it was just a preposterous idea. So one thing, one thing, William, about my character... Yes. Um, given his skills, I would think he would have an art of some kind. Or given his career, I'm sorry. Because I'd like to put his career to use right now, if I can. Yes. And basically create my own little sketch map of the cemetery with Desjardins' grave marked on it. You know, just a quick little, like, outline, maybe any roads and pathways in it, and then mark down his grave. Uh, certainly. Give yourself, uh, let's say, 40% in art cartography. There you go. They made it. Uh, yep. Success. All right. So you have a handy little sketch map. Mm. Mm. It's just like a, one of these men of artistic disposition to spend time in the day just taking a quick sketch of the place. It's so uh, very, it's, very and, popish. And you are... Really a man of the people, right? Well, of the right people, yes. So I think it is only just that when we return tonight to see what's in that coffin, you do the digging. <laughs> uh, I don't think I've ever done a day's digging in my life. but let, Well, let's you're doing maybe, a night's digging. <laughs> maybe we can have a wager on it. Anyway, we need to not draw any undue attention to ourselves if that's the plan. Right. How many burying grounds are there in Reims? There is something like a half dozen okay. various cemeteries. And is Desjardins in the largest? Largest and oldest. Okay. Largest so, and oldest. So I'm, I'm going to track down the caretaker and ask him whether there's undertakers that prepare the coffins for burial, or there's particular ones that are used for these burials, or whether there's a lot of them or just one in town. So in regards to... Desjardins, he can check his records for you. Mm -hmm. Yes, that'd be very and helpful. He can tell you that Desjardins was processed through Guillaume's funeral chamber, a well-appointed funeral home a few blocks from the cathedral. And as long as we have the caretaker's attention, mm -hmm. good sir? Yes. In this particular burying ground... Are they all of Desjardins' class, or might uh, 
a hard-working yeoman might be able to find himself interred here as well. Mostly upper class, but there are some middle class burials. Okay. And are they all interred in coffins? Yes. Or are those. Okay. And just because I'm asking questions, any of the plague years, are there mass burials? No. The mass burials would have been in plague pits towards the edge of town, many of which are now built over and have neighborhoods on top of them. Okay, well, I don't have any other questions for Mr. Constantine. I'm not sure, do you, Edmund? What is the average time it takes for a body to be interred here, like from the time the plot is per- printed or purchased until the body goes in the ground? On average. Three or four days. Is there a standard priest who performs services? From the cathedral, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Is the cathedral fairly close or adjacent to the burial ground? Um, I'm not actually sure. Let's see what Google Maps has to say. The cemetery is about two and a half kilometers north of the cathedral. Okay. Okay, so it's not adjacent. Very much not so. It's definitely the carriage ride away. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, and the funeral home was actually somewhere near the cathedral. Yes. You go where the business is. <laughs> Make it convenient. So what time of day is it by now? Is it is there still uh, afternoon hours left? Yes. Well, since my good colleague has some, some particular plans for this evening, I, I won't suggest we actually visit the funeral home while we've got some daylight hours left. Yes, that would be that would be a good idea, I think. So we'll jump in the coach, which we've still got, I guess, hired on retainer, and head off down to the funeral home and cathedral area, see if we can see anything interesting at the undertakers. So the funeral home itself is a pretty modest place. It's a two-story building on a street corner marked with a simple sign denoting its business. You are greeted on arrival by a slender young man who introduces himself as Alexander, and he is friendly and pleasant and kind of treating you with the assumption that you are here to pay your final respects to the recently deceased. Yes. Well, obviously we're very interested in understanding how his business works. Actually, I was uh, referred to you especially by the family of the Desjardins, who I understand you did some excellent work for just a week or so ago. Oh, you're asking for Mr. Yo. <laughs> Mr. Yo? I do apologize. Alexander is the door greeter. Most interested to talk to whoever actually did such an excellent job. Oh, and um, Jean-Paul, you should ask if they take returns. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a generous recycling scheme? Um, so, yes, I would love to speak to Mr. Yeo just to congratulate him. So he swiftly leads you down a hallway to his boss's office. He knocks and pokes his head in and says, Mr. Gio, there are two men here to see you. He ushers you in and then... Alexander makes his way back to the front. The office itself is just bland and unoffensive with minimal decor other than a large watercolor painting of the sun setting over the Reims Cathedral. Seated behind a large oak desk is a solidly built middle-aged man with uh, rather heavy jowls and dressed in dark clothing, in all aspects looking exactly what you would imagine a funeral director should look like. Greets you warmly and introduces himself as Gabrielle Gio, the owner of the of the company. Well, Mr. Gio, I'm delighted to make your acquaintance. It's such an honor to meet a master craftsman. I was a friend, a close colleague of Desjardins, who I believe you recently did such a superb job at preparing for burial. Yes, yes, Mr. Desjardins. We, I believe he was buried last week. Yes, indeed. It was truly a terrible tragedy for all of his friends to see him pass. Do you do a lot of burials in the North Cemetery? Yes, given, given the social standing of our primary clientele, I would say probably 65-70% of our burials are in the North Cemetery. 
My colleague, Mr. Mr. Jordan, is more of a man of the people and his many friends that perhaps would not be able to afford your services. Are you saying that basically you only work on the people of means? Well, not precisely. We are, of course, obligated by the state to serve all of the people of Reims. We do perform paupers burials and the like as well. Which burial grounds would people of less means normally end up so that I could avoid ever having a life which leads me such a place? He pauses for a moment, taken off guard by your question of what cemetery to avoid being buried in. It's a fair question. (laughs) He does give you the name of basically a potter's field. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, he is obligated by law to handle the cases of those who die without next of kin to pay for burial, bodies who are unidentified at time of death, things like that. So uh, does all of the preparation of the remains happen here in your fine establishment? Yes, it does. Desjardins, you worked personally on him? No, not directly. Much of the day-to-day is handled by my assistants. Would you know who did that excellent job on him? But I was somewhat of a connoisseur of such things. He pulls a ledger down from a shelf in his office and says, Yes, I do believe uh, it was Frederick Belrose who worked on your friend. Is Mr. Belrose working today? Give me a luck roll. <laughs> that is a failure. He is not. I'll have to return some other time to give him my compliments. I will be sure to pass along your regards, sir. Is there perhaps anything else I can help you with? I do have a general question. When it comes to time for the internment, is it typical for the burying ground to use their own staff, or might third parties be hired for the internment? I believe burying grounds use their own staff. My staff simply drive the... The Mariah? Yes. Although we do we do have our own grave diggers on staff when the need arises. And what need might arise that would require a, an unusual quantity of grave digging? Well, in times of war, revolution, illness, one can never be too careful. This is a whole industry that fascinates me in some strange and perverse way. Stories have been coming to me from far afield in places like England of foul deeds done, the theft of bodies. And Have you ever heard of such a thing happening in France? He looks at you very oddly for a moment and says, well, no, cadavers for medical purposes are very strictly regulated, so you don't have the sorts of cases such as Burke and Hare, where individual physicians are paying for anatomical dissection cadavers. It's all done through schools licensed with the crown. Well, that is very reassuring to hear that it's a much more civilized and organized way of doing things. I pray that it should never break down, given the the terrible state that this country has fallen into under the, the new regime's. Both of you go ahead and give me an insight roll, please. No, and neither of us got it anyway, so I've got to fumble, possibly. All right. right. So, the situation seems perfectly normal to you. Fair enough. All right, well, we're probably done here, I guess. He seemed like a nice gentleman. Have a coin. Have a coin? Well, yeah. Do you think? I, I, I think he's had enough. Okay. Maybe a time for a bottle of Beaujolais. All right, so Mr. Jordan, you have some plans for nocturnal activities. Let's make sure we have a fine repast before that. Yeah. I, think, I feel and, I'm going to need a stout dinner. And what time is it now? It's probably getting on towards late afternoon. Do we want to try to track down uh, Frederick Belrose? He didn't give us an address or anything, so... We but we have... To... We're both administrators. Yeah, that's true. Well, why not? Let's have a quick look at the city records, whatever yeah. we have access to. Mm-hmm. And actually, while we're there searching through the administration, if, if we actually have access to some city records, we'll just basically see whether there's any other reports of bodies going missing. 
as we're flicking through the records of regulated industry. Give me an administrative roll. <sighs> I got an eighty percent chance of success, and I failed. But Chad yeah. succeeded twice. You're twice, much for each of us. So you can track down an address for Frederick Bellrose. You don't find any no, other other any... unusual things. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. All right, well, let's go uh, pay him a, a late afternoon visit. I'll mm. bring a bottle of wine. You will, won't you? Of course. If he doesn't want it, then we can't have it go to waste. You would never let that happen, would you? It never has. It never has, my good friend. Uh, you can very easily find your way to Melrose's home, and knocking on the door, you are met by a uh, young Frederick, a man in his mid to late 20s, tall and lean and dark-haired. Mr. Belrose. Yes, what can I do for you? I am awed to be in the company of an artist such as yourself. I was a friend of Monsieur Desjardins. I understand whose mortal remains you've managed to turn into such a work of art. I need that sachet now. <laughs> <laughs> you know I what? Just... Go ahead and... I think at this point I need that to be a reassure roll. <laughs> <laughs> reassure. Okay, I'm not so good at that. No, sorry. <laughs> Who am I reassuring? Am I reassuring Edmund or Belrose? Reassuring Belrose that you're not a necrophiliac or something like that. <laughs> I'm clearly failing in that. <laughs> he is very clearly disconcerted, and uh, <laughs> I'm very sorry for your loss. I... I'm afraid I'm not personally acquainted with the, the bodies I work on. Is there anything else I can do for you? Well, I did have a curiosity about the way the bodies are actually transported to the burial ground after you've worked on them. How does that normally work in your company? There's a pair of Teamsters, Claude and Bruno. If you'll excuse me, I must be going. He starts closing the door on the two of you. I'm not used to being treated in such a way. But, uh, I thought uh, he was... Drink your wine. Well, I think maybe it's that time of day. What an impolite young man. I think back in my generation, they would never have been able to get away with such impotence still. Such is the way that things are going. Well, I guess we'll have a quick dinner and then maybe go grab some shovels. Early uh, yeah, as, a shovel. Yes. As you are sitting down to supper, you hear a young boy in the street selling newspapers calling out about a werewolf seen in Reims. My curiosity is piqued. I'm going to use some of the loot that was given to us to buy a newspaper. I'm not going to use my own. All right. You buy a newspaper and reading the cover story, you learn that three hours after sunset last night... In the neighborhood of La Nouvelle, a shot rang out, echoing up and down the quiet street. As people opened their shutters or stepped out of their homes to see what was going on, they witnessed a very large, muscular man, dressed only in a pair of trousers, galloping down the street on his knuckles like an ape. Clenched in the man's jaw, he had a small dog gripped by the nape of its neck. The dog was not dead as it was clearly heard yelping in pain. The man disappeared into the darkness before anyone could properly react. As of this morning, the dog was identified as a spaniel named Gaspard, belonging to Francine Berenger, the daughter of Jean-Charles Berenger, a well-known banker in Reims. I will show this to Edmund to say, like, let's look at what this country is going to after God's appointed monarch is disturbed from the throne. And which paper is this? L'Impartial des Ardennes. It doesn't um, get more impartial than that. It is typically a staunchly anti-monarchist newspaper with strong Republican leadings, but it will run stories in which legitimists and Bonapartists are the aggrieved parties as well, as long as uh, the sorts of stories that will sell newspapers. Well, Wolfman stories always sell, in my experience. I don't know, what do you make of this? Is, what, what was her name? Francine. Perhaps Mademoiselle Francine is a drinking companion of yours? The daughter? Or perhaps the uh, daughter of a drinking companion of yours? Possibly. Uh, the father may be more of my circle of friends. What was his name again? Uh, Jean-Charles. Do I know him? Give me a luck roll. Also, I'm fairly resourced up. I fumbled my luck roll. 
but I have a resources of 16. Seems like the sort of amount of cash that might have some affiliation with the banking sector. Yeah, I'll say you, you're you at least familiar with the name. Maybe you can't put a face to it, but you have heard. Well, with my fumbled luck it. roll, I probably put the wrong face to it. Yes, I never drunk with the man, but uh, I am aware that he's a man of fine, fine standing in society. Never met the Spaniel, though. Or Gispoed. Perhaps you can visit this associate of yours for a late dinner. I could give it a go. All of the well-to-do in Reims, surely all their doors would be open to me for a late night visit, I'm sure. I am sure, yes. So, Bill, would I be able to figure out where he lives? Oh, yes. The newspaper prints his address. Well, let's go around. I'll grab another bottle of Beaujolais before I leave the cafe. Take it with me. You can make your way into the neighborhood of La Nouvelle. Swear to your dad, you're going to make me seem like a complete lunatic <laughs> one of these days. <laughs> yeah, I'm, it's me. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, you're immediately struck by what you see among the people on the street. Men all have clubs and knives thrust through their belts, and even some of the women that you see on the street are visibly armed. While you can hear children daring each other to stay up for a glimpse of the werewolf that night. Those superstitious fools. Good Frenchman. What seems to be going on here? The person you talk to looks at you like you've fallen off the back of a turnip truck. Haven't you heard about the werewolf? What cycle of the moon is it right now? Although, is that a component of the French werewolf myths? I don't think the full moon actually came into it until the 1940s. Okay, with um, Cheney and stuff? Yeah. Okay, ignore that then. Strike it from the record. So, anyone you talk to can tell you that there's a lunatic roaming abroad who broke into the Barringer house and tried to attack the lovely young Francine Barringer. Instead, the lunatic got her dog. Everyone is on edge, expecting this madman to show up again. Does anybody know his identity? Is he a local? A, a local peasant? No one recognized him from the brief glimpses that people got of him last night. He moved very fast for a man knuckle-walking. But he was very big and very muscular. And which direction did he go? He was actually probably heading northwest on the Street of Three Kings. Well, John Palmet, perhaps a werewolf is to blame for all of our problems. A superstitious nonsense, I'm sure. Uneducated people these days will believe anything. But I do believe that a terrible crime may have happened against the fine upstanding banker who this peasant muscle head well maybe we can continue on to the banker's house and he may have some clues you can easily find your way to the Barringer house all right well knock on the door a heavy set silver haired woman opens the door and before you can even say anything she's saying you i'm sorry the Barringers are not accepting visitors at this time oh no no but we are not visitors i'm i'm one of his close uh, business colleagues i have invested the majority of my savings with mr barringer and it's his close friend i'm here to console him in his time of grief i heard of, of his terrible ordeal last night Give me i bought the i bought wine of your choice <laughs> okay of my choice this would be... let's go with bootlick success on bootleg, but it would have also been a success on harangue taunt. All right. So she reluctantly lets the two of you in. I'll put the wine down on the table. Says, perhaps you could uncork that and bring it in, into the room once I've had a chance to console my good friend. She takes the wine into the kitchen, and you hear a man's voice call, who the hell is it? Oh, Mr. Barringer, Mr. Barringer, you'll remember me from the bank, I'm sure. I'm Jean-Paul Langlois. Uh, coming into his study, 
John Charles, the heavy set man in his late forties, with thinning hair combed pretty desperately across his scalp, and a very thick kind of walrus mustache that wiggles as he speaks. Ah, it's my sort of person. He rubs his eyes as he looks at you and says, I'm terribly sorry, I, I'm not remembering you at the moment. Oh, no, 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 you've had such a terrible ordeal. I Just, you sit down. There's no, no additional strain should be placed upon you at, at this terrible time. But I'm here for no other reason to be consoling you in this difficult time. And also these terrible, ridiculous stories of werewolves being passed around in the gutter media. I can't believe that people would stoop so low as to try to destroy your good name. Pray tell, what did actually happen? Was there a break-in? Yes. I've given my statement to the police. It's Francine's story more than mine. She woke up to Gaspard, her dog, barking at the shutters of her bedroom window. And as she woke up, the shutters were forced open. A a large, dirty hand began feeling along the windowsill. Francine screamed. The dog launched itself at the hand, sinking its teeth into it. Drawn by her scream, I, I entered the room and fired a shot at whoever it was with this. And he taps a very heavy cavalry pistol sitting on his desk. Goes to show, really, one must always have a prime flintlock within one's grasp. Whoever it was, they dropped away from the window, carrying Gaspard with him. He dropped to the ground and got up and ran off. We never got a good look at him. Or it. Such lawlessness would never have been allowed under King Charles. No, they would not. I should introduce you to my good friend, Edmund, who has a particular interest in the criminal classes. I thought he may be able to reassure you by pointing out that the malefactor will certainly come to justice, I'm sure. Even if not at the hands of the John Dummery, who in this day and age are comically inept in my experience. Perhaps you can take greater comfort in the fact that it's unlikely that he will return here. He might have what he wants. And so Francine might be safe. But I'm assuming that the brute was here to steal and to rob the house. Disturbing that this should be allowed to happen. Is there anything we can do to bolster the security of your dwelling? No, I've made some calls and no one's available to repair the broken shutters until tomorrow morning. Let us have a look at them right now, because I think think it's far too dangerous. Even if we actually just do a temporary job ourselves, maybe we can have a look, see what needs to be done to fix it. I can't stand by and see an acquaintance of mine be placed in such peril another night. He leads you upstairs to the second floor of the townhouse, knocking on Francine's door. Francine, these two men are here to take a look at the shutters. Oh. So I wasn't expecting this to be an upstairs window through which this brute had... Did he climb the wall? Is there a trellis? Look out the window, I guess. Uh, yeah. If you you look out the window, you can see that a drain pipe run pe- runs past the window. And you can see where the pipe has been crushed in places. As in crushed by it's, somebody uh, very strong? That is what it looks like. Like someone incredibly strong climbed the drain pipe hand over hand. And taking a look at the shutters, uh, you can see that they were not picked or finessed open. They were simply pulled on with enough force to bend the latch until it failed. Well, have you ever seen such a thing, Edmund? I have not. You've seen some strange things in the French West Indies, but... This is not one of them. Well, Mr. Barringer, I think this should be sealed over for the night, even if we can temporarily put some things over it just to make sure that the brute doesn't come back. Yeah, why don't you um, climb up the drain pipe there and you can nail a board across the shutter so they can't be pulled open? (laughs) Oh, you jest, I'm sure. I wouldn't. I'm happy to pay someone to. Such manual labor would be well beyond my station in life. Both of you give me an alertness roll, please. Nope. Uh, yes. Chad got 
Edmund looking out the window, a glimmer in... So there's a small yard that Francine's window overlooks. And in the evening sunlight, you can see something glittering on the ground. Jean-Paul, why don't you stay here and comfort Francine and tell her all of how you will protect her. I'll be right back. I must step outside. Comfort so I'm going head... to comfort Jean-Charles. Gentleman's gentleman. Yeah, I'll be right back. So I'm going to head down there and just, what do I find? So there's a small yard surrounded by a brick privacy fence. Uh, examining the ground, you find some small splatters of blood, a few bare human footprints, and five gold francs scattered across the ground. Five, okay, so five francs. Are they bare footprints, did you say? Yes, like, bare human un, footprints. Un, unshod? Unshod? Um, unshod. How do they compare to, say, mine? They are big. I mean, like the type of situation uh, might be like, where well, that's a big foot. Yeah, size 13 or 14 shoes. And do they just seem to originate from the street? You know what I mean? Like he walked in from the street? Looks like the owner of the feet jumped the fence and approached to where the drain pipe empties out. Mm -hmm. And then another set of footprints originate by the blood splatters seem to head back towards the wall. So what is on the other side of the fence from where they seem to originate? Uh, and what type of fence is this? A rod, like a wrought iron fence? It's like a brick wall. Like a low wall? Five foot, six foot? Yeah, about five feet tall. Probably some ornamental iron work on top of it. And beyond the wall is an alleyway separating it from another townhouse. And an alleyway wide enough for a carriage to go down, or, or is it narrow? Narrow. Okay. But traffic only. Like a gangway? Yes. So I'm going to collect the five francs. And now how much, I mean, how many drops of blood? A lot or a little? A little. And, and where were those in relation to everything in, in the garden? Probably about four or five feet out from the drain pipe. And quick look at the drain pipe. Are there smears of blood on there? No. Okay, so perhaps canine blood, or he was bit. Something like that. Does okay. seem like a reasonable inference. Okay, so I'm gonna take a quick look at the francs. How old they are they? Pretty recent, minted within the last year or two. Anything unusual about them? Nothing odd that you can see. Okay, Jean Paul might know better. He knows his coins very well. But I'm just gonna poke my head down the alleyway again. Any more blood? Yeah, you do see there's a brief trail leading around the house to the main street. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go retrieve Jean-Paul from his important duties. In the meantime, by the way, I've been directing the household staff into just moving around heavy bits of furniture to cover over the broken shutters and stuff like that to basically secure the daughter's bedroom without doing any physical labor myself. Beyond pointing. That's right, just directing as well. It's called delegating. Well, I'll have to teach you one day. But yeah, I'll come back into the room and witness this master of delegation and um, go up and tell him I found money. Oh, okay. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> I also found footprints and blood. This is from the brute, I take it, down the bottom of the drain pipe. I'll go show Jean-Paul everything I found. And I also think that my current belief is that the blood is from either Gaspard or where the assailant was bit by Gaspard. Remind me, was the story that the dog was dead when people saw him carrying him in his jaws, was it? People reported hearing the dog yelping in pain. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the it, dog was never found, so it was taken with him. So right. the dog could be held hostage somewhere. <laughs> That's what be the five francs. I show Jean-Paul the Frank. Do I notice anything unusual about them? I guess they just, I've seen plenty of them. It's got the wrong king's head on them, I'm sure, but let's see. Constant source of annoyance for me. Apart from that, nothing else? 
Nothing out of the ordinary, and honestly, they probably do all have Charles' head on them. Okay, good. I, I suggest that we keep them separate from the other bag of coins for right now. Yep. Just in case. And I show in the alleyway, too, where the blood drops, and they lay out into the main street, and I'm who are completely lost now. Out on the main street, are there still vigilante groups wandering around with weapons? Yes, and... Now they seem to be organizing themselves into patrol groups, ready to spend the night roaming the street in search of the werewolf. You know, if you ask around, the general consensus seems to be that the police are not taking the werewolf seriously. That's no big surprise. And... So, based on the story, I mean, I understand that he was very muscular. I'm asking this of a person there. Very muscular. And yep. walked on his knuckles as well as his feet, right? Yes. Much like a gorilla that you see in the African jungles, right? So, gorillas have not been identified yet, but yeah. Oh, really? An orangutan or something like that. Yeah, the first gorilla skull was collected in 1847. Because it's not long from now when we get murder in the Rue Morgues, right? Orangutan might be mm -hmm. a more familiar reference point. Okay. Good to know. With all these people wandering around the streets, I'm not sure that anything much is going to be discovered tonight unless he returns for a repeat attempt. And then there'll be such a hullabaloo. We'll probably hear that from streets away. Um, but back to my line of questioning, though. Mm -hmm. Bring that up to an orangutan. And he had the spaniel in his mouth. Yes. But what made you think werewolf? Were there lupine uh... features? More just a general sense of behaving like a wolf. It seems to be the werewolf moniker may have more to do with what these people have as a reference point for comparison, as much as okay. anything. Is there a zoo or any kind of place that there may be lots of animals nearby or in Reams anywhere? Yes, there is a zoo. In this general area or different part of the city? No. Closer to the center of the city. To me, that seems a much more likely explanation is that some beast from the zoo has escaped, taken this poor spaniel, and possibly stolen some money along the way. It's harder to understand. The man you're speaking to says, no, it was definitely a man. And I'll tell you what I think. I think this is a member of the royal family, exiled from Paris, for being a deranged lunatic. And that's why the police aren't investigating. They know it's a royal, and they've been paid by the crown to not intervene. Well, the recent monarchy, I can see that there probably are plenty of lunatics in the family. Oh. But uh, what do you base this upon, though? Have you heard word on the street about such a scheme to send such a person into the reams? Yeah, he tells you the rumor has been circulating all day, and mm -hmm. no one else has been able to come up with any good reason for why the police aren't investigating. Right. So I think I'd probably go with incompetence over conspiracy theory. So, Edmund, is there anything else you'd want to question so, this mean, Do you think it's a royalist, or do you think it was King Charles himself? <laughs> I'm just inquiring for a friend. Hmm. Sometimes I think that they dismantled those guillotines too early. So, yes. Now, there's got to be a point where people saw it, and then they didn't see it anymore, which implies it turned. wonder if we can track that down. Is that on that street of Three Kings? Yes, that was the street that people saw it on. It would be interesting to try and figure out how far away was it still seen by people if you do some asking around you can find a couple people who claim to have seen it and the farthest one out seems to have been about 500 yards from Barringer's house and everyone you talk to says they lost sight of it in the darkness because the streets are not particularly well lit at, at night. So at that roughly 500-yard mark, what's there? 
cross there street is... or an alleyway or yeah there's an alleyway just out of curiosity any signs of blood down one of the alleyways because it would probably have been less traveled than the main street well, i'm kind of picturing that these alleyways have just got incidental signs of blood that, that's entirely possible <laughs> it, it could be just standard decor yeah go ahead and give me a search roll please he succeeded you do not find blood per se but or a large footprint uh, on top of a pile of refuse, you do find about half of a spaniel. Oh, no. Oh. Gaspard. Poor guy. <sighs> Which half? Um, Front no. or back? Or left? <laughs> <laughs> the, the whole carcass is there, but most of the meat is missing. Does it look like it's been eaten? Yes. Well, this is disturbing. Jean Paul, that King Charles just... would do this, but he's <laughs> fallen so far. Yes, well, you know, they say, let them eat dog. You know what? Would the two of you like to make a sanity roll for me, please? <laughs> About each other, or? <laughs> yes. Well, you certainly were not expecting to find. I failed. A partially eaten. 55, I guess, is my starting sand, right? So, uh, Jean-Paul, you lose one point of sanity. Is that from violence? Uh, yes. Okay, I will tick the little box to say incident of sand loss without going insane. So I can always forget to do. So we should probably return Gaspard, do you think? I suppose so, unless there's any other evidence... I mean, any information to be... I'm, I'm not saying we return him right now. I'm just saying in the big picture. We yeah, return I guess. Return Gaspard. Yeah. Well, as opposed to sort of nailing him to the front door of Barringer's house or something. Yes. <laughs> that would be particularly disturbing. Yeah, no, it does seem like the right thing to do. Perhaps you can get a shovel and um, you can bury Gaspard as practice for your other... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I think I might just put my back out just doing that small task so I couldn't possibly do anything more strenuous. Yeah. yeah. So it's more work um, than I've done in the years. What basically blocks in this alleyway? What built houses or businesses or? Probably a combination of the two. And uh, yeah. do you think we should follow this, um, Jean-Paul? See mm -hmm. where this alleyway leads us? I mean, I'm I'm sure that a man of stature like yourself is a master duelist anyway. I'm sure I am not a, acquainted with such base tools of violence, but mm -hmm. I do have enough status in this town that I don't think we're in any danger of running afoul of anybody. It's uh, important people like myself. And failing that, my lawyer... All right, we'll go for a walk just to see where... I don't want to walk too far, though. Where do we park the coach? I think at this point you're going to need to get another one. I'm assuming it's kind yeah. of like a taxi service. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought we had him on retainer. Yeah. Anyway, um, we, can, we, we can always we, we, hire we, we, another. We can hire a coach to get back to where we park the coach. All right. You we'll probably left it outside Barringer's house. I reckon we probably did. Well, we'll go for a short walk to see if there's anything interesting we find on the trail. It does feel like the trail may be going cold at this point. And it, it is evening. Mm. Okay. Uh, In the big picture map of Rames, where does this alleyway lead? If we went this way, we'd go back to the cemetery, or would we go to the cathedral or mortuary? I don't mean this alleyway leads directly there, but... No, you're actually north of pretty much everything. This is kind of a suburb of Reims that you're in now, and it's you know, kind of a network of alleyways between buildings that don't necessarily lead anywhere. They're just kind of a byproduct of you know urban sprawl. Byproduct of no building code? Yeah. <laughs> So the road that heads out north into the countryside where the wagon was originally found, is that 
in that same general vicinity or that beginnings of that road heading out north or is this a different part of the northern suburb of Reims? Different part. That road is 30 minutes east of where you okay. are. Well, I'm certainly not going to walk 30 minutes. Now, where, just out of curiosity, where is the now defunct university? That I couldn't tell you at this time. Some angry professor from the... There's always the an angry professor. When the university was shut down, just doing experiments. Well, you never know. No one of the is. other rumors, one of the other rumors you hear from the, uh, from the people on the street is a suggestion that the werewolf is in fact a veteran of Napoleon's campaigns with what we would now call PTSD, released from medical confinement in the chaos of the July Revolution. Sentiment seems to be he became a beast in the service of the Emperor and could not return to being a man. Jean-Paul, with your past military experience, you recognize that the people repeating that rumor are men of an age where they are likely to be veterans of Napoleon's Grand Army as well. And the mood is kind of one of there, but for the grace of God, go I. Well, I can relate, I suppose. Terrible days. I'm not sure that those stories, though, are helping us really figure out what's going on. They just seem to be wild speculation that would kind of fill in the gaps. In the I'm episode. still leaning in the King Charles. Uh -huh. Yeah, I bet you are. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps if we do run into him, you can meet a man that's actually worthy of sitting on the throne. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps you can learn from the experience. Anyway, did you have an appointment with the graveyard, perhaps? Shall we? Uh, if we must. Can we hire somebody to do this instead? We've kind of still got our purse full of coins. I mean, if you want to, I'm fine with that. But uh, I did not realize that you were a military man, so surely you're good at, you know... Uh, delegating, a yes. <laughs> delegating a hole. Oh, you were an officer in the military. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> a a gen gentleman of breeding wouldn't do anything crash, surely. But I do feel that uh, maybe the illegality of what you're proposing might be something that we shouldn't engage somebody else that we would need to trust. So let's go and do whatever it is that you think we need to do. I'm just curious. It makes sense. So so let's go exhume what was previously inhumed. Dejardin. I'll take an extra flagon of ale. <laughs> it seems like thirsty work. So you make your way to the North Cemetery. Presumably you've made arrangements for shovels. Yeah. I'm sure we have access to shovels with the resources available to us. Are both of you digging, or just one of you? I, the trouble is, I can't use harangue against Edmund, really, so otherwise I'd give it a go. I think time is of the essence, really, because we don't mm -hmm. want to get caught. Yes, that's very much the case. Mm -hmm. So well, I'd say we and, both unless, and, unless one of the, well, the other one's staking watch. Until each of us gets tired, in my case, it's probably about five minutes, and Edmund's mm -hmm. case, it's probably an hour or so. So working together, you're able to open the grave that is marked as Desjardins. You hit the coffin and pulling it open, there is a body buried there. It but is it's uh, not Desjardin. No. Does it look like somebody well-to-do or a pauper? A uh, pauper. It's actually an old woman. Uh, I told you, these dodgy undertakers it was so rude when we went to visit him in his home, too. Does the body what? look like it coincides with when it would have been there? Or, and not like it had been just stored to be dumped right. in here later? Right, it's the same level of um, decomposition as mm -hmm. Desjardins. So how does this play into your suppositions of what happened, Mr. Jourdain? I'm not sure. 
Obviously, for some reason, they wanted that body and not this one. You think right. it was targeted or just a random thing that they happened but, to choose a, such a recognizable body? But that's where it is confusing because they're not all of Desjardins' social class, right? Indeed. And so it seems to, seems to me that if somebody was just paying for cadavers, then it's going to be a lot easier for them to convince somebody in the undertaker's office to actually slip them some peasant bodies that nobody will even miss than to actually... Like this one, right? Like the one that we're looking at? Well, yeah, exactly. But so why not steal that one if you're actually going to sell it for experiments? It's worth just as much as Desjardins. But right. taking one that's high profile and might get missed feels like a much more risky prime. So why would you do it? Unless there was something about the man himself. But then what would be... But then that would make you think there was something about each one of the... Um, the other 11 as well. Yeah. Who were unremarkable. It's it's a bit baffling why grave robbers would actually behave in that way, or unless there was a mistake. But it does point to something amiss in the Undertaker's practice. Yep. Anyway, we need to fill in this hole. Yeah, we, and... And the flag and a hole in our is, knowledge, too. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Unfortunately, the flagon of ale has already been used up, so this is going to be a bit of a drier task, but uh, we'll take it in turns again. Obviously, being in um, early 19th century France, I think we come to the conclusion that for some reason somebody needs bodies that are RH, with RH negative blood. They're not nearly as common as RH positive, so <laughs> okay. they need these RH negative blood bodies and you know, they're swapping them out just to get them for some reason, obviously. And, Apparently, guess code is well, we hard test. with RH yeah, negative. We didn't test those things, I have to say. Yes. If only. Mm, if only. Well, we can still go back. I, I'm feeling quite tired, so we should basically retire for the night. Maybe we should breakfast together and see what new theories have actually emerged with this addition of information. And also see if there's another article or another werewolf attack. That's true. That's true. And maybe also to figure out what's happened to the rest of these bodies. The the mortuary seemed disinclined to keep them for much longer. So if we want to actually look at them again, then uh, we may already have missed our chance. So yes, those are all things for tomorrow. In the meantime, I think there's some cognac with my name on it as a nightcap. You do have a large cellar, shall we say. <laughs> Not so large as it needs to be. So the night passes uneventfully. Uh, and you uh, enjoy breakfast at a small but upscale cafe. As you are leaving, uh, you are approached by a pair of gendarmes, one of the first of whom says, uh, Excuse me, uh, Mr. Jean Paul Langlois mm -hmm. and Mr. Emma Jordan, if you'll please come with me, we have some questions for you. I would love to assist the gendarmerie, but my friend and I are still in the middle of our breakfast. Well, will you oh, come I'll... with me once you have completed your meal? Sure. Just tell us who in the gendarmerie to report to, and we shall come post-haste. Forthwith, even. Who is it that wants to speak with us? Duval? Yes, the massage Duval. guy. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Very well. Edmund, do we want to talk to him? Let's say this after they've gone. Okay, all right, well, let's go have a chat to him. But we'll do it on our terms. Yeah, he's got your money. He might, he might end up with some more of it if he's actually spotted something that we've done. Well, we'll head there after breakfast. Or, or do we go in on the offensive? With what? The murder of Gaspode. The dog? Yeah. <laughs> Is it murder when it's a spaniel? Canine aside? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that is a crime that the police aren't doing enough about. Mm-hmm. Certain. I think they're definitely not doing enough to look after wealthy bankers. There you go. Either way, we've got something to complain about. So yes, but let's go and hear the man out first. I mean, you have a you have a knack for that, don't you? Well, yes, for all sorts of things. <laughs> for finding something to complain about. <laughs> it's in my DNA, which we probably don't know about yet. Although I do say that we tell him that King Charles killed a dog. 
<laughs> King Giles is a werewolf. Mm-hmm. Well, you can go with that theory. You and your friends at the press. So we'll casually make our way over to the central police station when it suits us. So, it's probably several uh, hours later. So when you arrive, you are met by Duval, who, before you can get a word out, asks if you can explain what happened at Thierry Constantine's mortuary yesterday. You looked at the bodies? Did something happen that we are not aware of? The bodies were removed from the mortuary, and Constantine himself is missing as well. You think he stole them? A bloody (gasps) fireplace poker was found at the scene. So as of right now, we do not believe that Constantine took the cadavers so much as that he was taken out with them. As I said, someone abducted 12 cadavers and a mortician. Indeed. So it would Possible appear... with, with, with violence. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, interestingly enough, some of his offsiders or his one offsider seemed particularly aggrieved. That would be my and... first line of inquiry were I in the position that you are in, Mr. Duval? Well, it seems that the two of you were the last to see Constantine alive. So you understand why I am beginning my line of questioning with the two of you. What exactly are you suggesting, Mr. Duval? Or basically alleging? I suggest only that you were the last two to see him alive. Okay, I'll rummage through my um, uh, wallet and pull out the business card, very ornate business card of my lawyer, and give it to him. Mm. This is the man that can help you, not me, and not Edmund, my friend. We have important business we need to conduct today. I guess going to the mortuary. That was the plan. We're not going to tell them that. All I ask is that you tell me what conversations you may have had with Constantine and what you may have seen during your visit to the mortuary, I see Mr. Duval, Mr. Duval, maybe if we're in the business of actually giving full and frank accounts of yesterday's actions, maybe we should also report the donation that we made to you and return for certain information. Would you care for us to make a full and detailed recounting of that on the record? Give me a harangue roll, please. (laughs) Oh, I hope I roll well. It's a failure, but I'm willing to throw some willpower to actually move that in whatever optional rule we had for doing that. Uh, by all means, go right ahead. I have to remember what the rule is. Assume that I just made it. I'll figure out what I need to take off of my sheet. Yep. <laughs> can we can we interject that rule? Just the assume I made it. <laughs> there is a way of nudging rolls. I'm just trying to remember how many willpowers. Duval takes a deep breath, and you can see he's kind of silently counting to ten, and says, Mr. Langlois, I am not accusing you or your associate of anything. I do not believe that you have motive to do so. I am asking simply if you observed anything unusual while you were there. And uh, I think we have given that full account already. So I'm not exactly sure why we are still standing in your office. By the way, the rule is that spending each willpower point, you can nudge a roll by up to five percentiles. So three willpower points for you then? Correct. That's what I did. And you can only nudge it into a standard success. You can't nudge it into a critical or a fumble. Okay. So Duval sits down, packs his pipe, lights it, and says, You are, by all means, free to go. If you should observe anything, please do keep me informed. Of course, we will do what any fine, upstanding citizen should do, and no more. I would expect nothing more. By the way, can I just say, I actually hate my character as well, but (laughs) (laughs) It, it it seems fitting. Yeah, it was it was particularly hard to make engaging player characters in the legitimist faction. <laughs> you know, the the Bonapartists and Republicans were actually the most fun. 
<laughs> I think we'll leave. And uh, are we going back yeah. to the mortuary? There might be some clues there. Edmund, is that still something worth doing? I think so, yeah. We're coming up on the end of the session. Do we want to stop it here since this seems like a good stopping yeah. spot? Yeah.